you know, you've written a decent amount, you know, over, over the years about how sort of, um, you know, realistic, um, you know, we could realistically envision, you know, some, you know, something that we would think of as a post-capitalist society coming, you know, coming about or working, which is something that I, I think historically a lot of people on the socialist left haven't, you know, haven't really said nearly as much about as they, as they should, like they're very vague about it. So do you want to kind of start us off with like how you like kind of generally think about the issue? Yeah, you know, as a kind of one-on-one starting point, what I would usually do is say, first things first, let's distinguish uh, the welfare state from from socialism, right? The welfare mm -hmm. state is a, a system of, of programs to provide for various populations or to provide health care, provide education. Um, those are benefits. That's not socialism, right? Socialism mm -hmm. is a separate thing that deals with uh, how production is organized in society specifically you know who's going to control and own companies for the most part right the productive entities that organize production day to day and so you know under the capitalist model you have a kind of shareholder capitalist firm where you have uh, you know there's this company and at the top of the company you have shareholders who own the equity, they appoint board members, those board members appoint a CEO, the CEO manages the company, primarily with a goal of trying to make as much money for the shareholders. And what we're trying to do is switch out essentially that corporate governance arrangement and create a different corporate governance arrangement where, and this is where things obviously start to spiraling in lots of different directions and where you get a lot of the fighting. <laughs> but uh, broadly speaking, we want to replace this shareholder class with uh, some other constituency, whether that's society, whether that's the workers in each firm, whether that's uh, you know some combination of the above, we're trying to replace that shareholder group with another group um, that we think of as, as as representing you know the proper socialist constituency who should actually operate ownership and control and make these productive decisions and also benefit from from production. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So I mean, I guess just to go back to the first thing that you that you said about socialism and and the welfare state. I mean, one way you might think of this is that like one of the core things that socialists have always objected to about current economic arrangements is um, that people are dependent on um, you know dependent on markets for things that maybe they shouldn't be uh, shouldn't have to be. Um, you know, and some of which might bleed into sort of social democratic welfare state concerns, but some of which has to do with uh, with class divisions, with with the idea that we shouldn't have a uh, a class of people who who own the you know means of production by which we presumably always mean something much broader than what people are typically th you know thinking of when they use the word production, you know the means of production and stuff like that and um distribution exchange extraction uh all that stuff and then um and then uh the a class of people who have to to work for them right you know that the one um you know one traditional you know socialist uh objection to uh to capitalism is that you have to um you know in order to make a living you know you have to you know, submit yourself to uh, to to a, a capitalist. You know, with by like signing an employment contract with them. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I noticed somebody in the in the chat asked about you know the sort of caring more about production or distribution, and like one way you might think about this as well. Look, one of the things we object to about capitalism is that we hate the distrib kind of distribution it gives rise to. We, you know, we, we think it's like a really bad distribution, but you might think that that's downstream of, or at least partially downstream of the means of production being sure. in the only part of the population. Well, it's important also to just, you know, and that this can be a little cutesy, but distribution, uh, the word would apply to different quantities. So usually when people say production or distribution, they, after the word distribution, they're implying income or consumption. Right, but obviously also ownership is distributed and control is distributed. So in a way, it's all an objection to distribution. <laughs> it's just different quantities. The socialists will tend to focus more on control and ownership, um, and and 
there's a whole other group of people uh, who maybe are less concerned about that or, and are interested in income and final consumption, you know. And there's overlap right. as well, of course. So, yeah, I mean, you might also think that, like, okay, you know, one of the, you know, you can look at the problem of um, income and final consumption being being distributed in a really horrible, inegalitarian way, and say this is at least partially caused uh, by the uh, by ownership and control being being distributed in a in a terrible way. That if if uh, you know that if if Amazon were owned by uh, the state, or it were owned by, or it were a worker co-op, or like any number of other arrangements that'd be really different from the from the existing one, you wouldn't have like Jeff Bezos getting so much of the income that's generated by Amazon that he could do things like go into space. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, because the ownership is going to determine a couple of things. One, who gets the profit share of the firm and capital income, which flows out to owners, is usually about 30% of all income. Um, and right now it's flowing mostly to the top 10%, like overwhelmingly. So if you capture that, which you would in a socialist economy, however you exactly organized it, then you're going to have a more equal society. And then like you point out, the way that they use their levers of control uh, can mm. also cause inequality through determining, for instance, how income is distributed inside a firm among workers, whether top executives are paid, you know, 10 times as much, five times as much, 100 times as much, whatever, right? That That's also being being decided by the controller. So okay. in, in part, I suppose you could, you know, bring in other factors, but... Fair enough, uh, Jake. Do you want to uh, do you want to jump in, jump in with anything before we move on to the next part of this? Well, yeah. Unless this is the next part. Um, I mean, I, I've I've listened to your, your your podcast. Big fan of the show, by the way. But uh, yeah, um, I have an idea where you might be on this. But you're mentioning that there's two camps, right? Who care? Uh, you know, on which side? Like like where we're focusing our efforts as socialists. So I was wondering which camp you describe yourself as part of. Yeah, and I guess I, there I was really thinking uh, more saying like conceptual camps. Um, mm. In practice, uh, you know, if you in the history of socialism, I think most socialists have been motivated by egalitarian uh, impulses one way or another. Obviously, some will deny this, and you know, we can go into the sort of psychoanalysis of why they deny this, and maybe they're sincere. I don't know, but even even if you take them for what they are, most people who have called themselves socialists clearly are strongly motivated by uh, uh, an egalitarian sort of political ethos. And I think that ethos really pushes you in both directions, right? Mm -hmm. You need egalitarian distributions of consumption and income as well as ownership and control. You're trying to get egalitarian distributions across, across the board. I would say where you have seen some distinction is uh, with groups of people that Rawls would call welfare state capitalists, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. who uh, only concern themselves with uh, sort of achieving um, some kind of egalitarian final distribution of income and do not care at all about um, how ownership and control is organized. Um, but none of those people, you know, that's, that's no, nobody here. No, none of the intra left, I feel like tends to, to be in that group. That would be sort of like your center, center left, I guess, or some, you know, um, dims, but even they, I don't know, even they are not maybe that far left even, which is funny, um, to think about, but, but yeah, these are conceptual groups. For me, I say all the above. And I also think the welfare state is an important institution, even in a socialist economy, you would want to have a welfare state. So, yeah, which is, um, I mean, I guess, I guess theoretically, you, I mean, like a logically possible combination of positions somebody could hold would be socialism. Yes. Welfare state. No, but like, I, yeah, I, I, I called that, that uh, I coined that desertist socialism in one of uh, the posts I wrote a long time ago. And I said, I don't know anyone. <laughs> I've had to invent this term because I've never actually seen it. But you could imagine a society in which they were saying, look, it's almost Randian in its sort of completeness. The workers must get it all. And I mean that quite literally. If you are disabled, <laughs> if you're you know, too old to work, I'm sorry, you're out of luck, you know. 
So yeah. this, this is kind of a, like an open take sphere that someone could adopt. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's in the advocate. set of possible positions, but I have not seen anyone really just sitting out commit. there waiting for somebody to someone to take it. I think yeah. actually <laughs> advocate it, but yeah, I mean, I think there are people who have said things that taken literally would uh, entail that, but I don't think any of them actually like sort of thought through the implications. Like, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so like historically famous example would be in the uh, the you know, Congress that started what would become the German Social Democratic Party, the uh, uh, the uh, the people, the uh, the faction around LaSalle had this this program that got adopted, the Gotha program that famously that has this line in it about how workers should get the full products of their labor. And one of, you know, Karl Marx and critique of the Gotha program, one yeah. of his big objections to that is hold on, guys really right like because 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 what about you know i mean that's one of his examples he uses some you know he's writing before the welfare state as we know it exists so he uses some phrase like poor relief right you know but yeah. like what about that right what about schools and hospitals what about building new factories yeah 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 no he's saying uh first things first we got to put money aside for administration we got to put money aside to replace the worn out machines and then though he doesn't use the term he's like then of course we have to put money aside for the welfare state. And then only after that should workers get paid. That's actually how he presents it in his critique, uh, which I, you know, that's always a fun one to throw in the face of certain kinds of, uh, of people online. I don't really know what to do with, with him being like, of course the, the welfare state would take priority <laughs> over worker wages in, in a final system. But Look, yeah, because some people kind of are, uh some camps are sort of looking down on redistribution right like of income and, and the welfare state is just this like social democracy right that doesn't have to do with like real communism or that's is that kind of a tendency that you're well, responding people, to at time yeah. people do do think that like people do say that but even the even people who say that i think would still say that like under whatever they would consider to be real socialism like we're, we're still gonna like like it's it's not like children and disabled people don't get any sort of consumption. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think you have a couple of tendencies there. One, you got people who just don't think about it, you know, and they think, cause there's this, definitely there's this thought that, you know, the welfare state only exists to really patch up the problems caused by low wages, you know? And so you fix that and you, you fix the problem. And it's like, no, I, you know, that we kind of, that's a thing that sort of circulates in the society. That's just not really true, right? I mean, unless you mean like literally like zero wages, because there's a lot of most people who are receiving benefits have zero to no wages, right? Because they're disabled or old or whatever. Um, you've got that problem. You got people who haven't thought just haven't thought through it at all. You then you do have a somewhat more sophisticated take that is it's kind of like well the welfare state is this ameliorist class compromise project, um, and I, it that then bleeds into this kind of accelerationist almost tendency to be like this is really preventing us from getting a real hardcore revolution because it it takes so many of the edges off the system, um, so. Right. Although even there, I mean, that's presumably like we're, we're having, if we're, um, you know, if you're going to say we shouldn't have, you know, we shouldn't have social security because then we won't have a socialist revolution, presumably like after the socialist revolution, there'll still be some sort of equivalent of social security. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's an order. It's an order of events. It needs to happen after, you know, we only get the old age pension after that's, that's when we need to implement, I suppose. Yeah, until then. We, we need them for the army now. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's a, that is a weird example. It's like, well, but th these people are defined by their um, <laughs> diminished physical uh, capacities. So I don't know that they're great agents of, you know, guerrilla war and whatnot, but. There is that. Uh, so, uh, okay. So thinking of, uh, so, okay. So there's the, the welfare state piece. And then there's the uh, then there's the like what happens to the um, the means of production piece, mm. right? So uh, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit more about what what your view is about that part? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I think I I view uh, I wrote a piece a long time ago called identifying socialist institutions in socialist countries, which is another way to try to avoid the, another trap that you fall into. You know, the first trap being conflating the welfare state with the socialist control and ownership. And then the second is getting too mixed up with uh, whether an economy or a country or a society is socialist 
versus, to my mind, a much more useful way to talk about it, which is whether a particular institution is socialist, uh, a particular mm. company, a particular productive unit. And so what defines whether in a unit of production is, is socialist, that would be, you know, mostly oriented around who owns and controls it. Um, so to give some concrete examples, uh, mm. the public schools are a good example, I think, of uh, productive units that are organized socialistically in a conventional public school system. You, it's set up just like any other firm, I mean, in a kind of structural sense, except uh, you have a school board that's elected by the local mm. people mm -hmm. instead of uh, a corporate board that's elected by shareholders and then go out to seek a CEO that then is trying to make money that they can get and kick out to shareholders. So by just kind of toppling the shareholders and replacing them with voters, you now have this productive unit um, that is, I would say, a socialist institution. Um, and, you know, you can go on and on down the board. Another example, so usually people would call that a general government service. Like mm -hmm. in the OECD classification, that would be like one form, right? It's because it is production. It's not just sending money out to people. You're actually organizing a productive service, and it's being organized this way. And then you have this other form, which is called a state-owned enterprise, which is very similar to the general government service, except the users pay more of a fee. So mm -hmm. the postal service would be an obvious example. You know, you pay your stamps, but there's no external owner of the postal service. It's owned by the federal government. They have a board. The board's appointed by the president, which is confirmed by the Senate, and on and on, right? Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority is another example. Amtrak is another example. Public utilities throughout the country, of which there are hundreds, thousands, you know, depending on how you all add it up, is the same mm -hmm. thing. We've got lots of public electric utilities, public water utilities. They all kind of structure the same way. Um, and then beyond that, I, you have the social wealth fund approach, where mm -hmm. instead of kind of setting up each entity as being 100% state-owned, you create a fund with money, very much like a mutual fund or a pension fund, and you go out and you kind of buy dispersed assets and dispersed control over existing firms. And then I would say the last one is the worker co-op uh, kind of model, where the workers in each firm would, uh, would become the shareholders, and then they would appoint the board, and then off you go. So it's all kind of about replacing the shareholder and replacing how the board is elected. And if you replace them in certain kinds of ways, I would say those are socialist institutions. And we're just trying to get, get that as widespread as we can. You know, that's the, my perspective on it, at least. Okay, yeah. So uh, you said at the beginning of all that that you think that it's like sort of maybe a less productive question. What counts as a, uh, a socialist country as opposed to, to socialist institutions? Because uh, you just want to... Um, you know, you just want to promote socialist institutions as much as possible. And, you know, what, what, what counts as having promoted them so much that it, it's a socialist country now is sort of a, um, is sort of a secondary question, but I mean, it is maybe worth lingering on that for just a minute because, um, I mean, I think that intuitively there is this kind of concept that people can have, uh, of, you know, having like, Okay, economies in general are, you know, almost invariably, you know, mixed economies of, of one kind or another, um, you know, like for, you know, most of the history of feudalism, there were non feudal institutions, you know, go, going on, right, there were, there were like free talents and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, but we think, you know, we think of Maybe I think like we we would think of like, you know, I don't know, the United States is an easy example as a capitalist country because we think like capitalist economic institutions like are dominant in a certain way in the in the economy. Uh, whereas when we're thinking about a socialist future, I mean, I don't necessarily um, it doesn't bother me necessarily if uh, if I sort of imagine a society that's everything that I dream that it ever could be. If like there are, you know, I don't know, like uh, there are like small amounts of wage labor going on here and there. Cause like, it doesn't really, you know, like if you have like a, um, I don't know, a podcast, right. You know, that, that could be like, well, you know, does it really, you know, it doesn't really make money. You know, it's like, it could be that like, you have like, you know, there's like one guy's working for it and it's like three hours a week, you know, and is, is this really, you know, like, 
like how how are you going to organize that right and and so, you know and and this, so this this hits close to home this example <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. the yeah, sole the sole proprietor <laughs> exception yeah let's call him Jake the uh, the guy who works <laughs> the podcast but uh but you know our character and our example but yeah um you know so it's like like but that's maybe doesn't bother me that much if it's like if it's like a small enough part of the economy that like people don't really um depend on sort of traditional capitalist wage labor as the sort of uh the thing you have to do in order to in order to to make a living i mean is is that i I would be i would be curious about how you think about like those sorts of of examples like maybe that the the question the sort of like what would count as like you know all right life is imperfect but what would count as like a sort of reasonable degree of success in uh in in achieving an economy that's dominated by the institutions you want to dominate it yeah you know it's it's a hard line drawing problem i've i've tried to uh you know figure out where other people have drawn this in the past um i actually asked brad DeLong this question a while ago and he told me that uh it would need to be that 65 percent of gdp was organized through these productive like you know through institutions in that way and i was like you know what if you add up norway it's like it's like 54 like it's really close <laughs> um and lane kinworthy actually just wrote a book about democratic socialism um and i think he used 60 percent um, but i think he was using um a percentage of employment mm. so not mm. percentage of gdp so 60 percent of workers were in those firms uh, those socialist more organized institutions so you know uh, you know we really want to hit that binary classification it's very yeah. hard to do and that's and i'm not even against doing it i think you're right of course like uh, we can identify that some societies have more of their systems organized this way than others and the u.s is much more organized uh, in this sort of private ownership way and then other countries are are less so um and you know we're moving in that direction i don't know how you ever get over any particular line mm-hmm. um but i also think that there are some practical benefits to this kind of approach which is that these questions that you were hitting upon which is well what do we do about each and every productive unit it's kind of you can push those way down the line and say well there's a lot of low hanging fruit where it's very clear how you could socialize you know if you wanted to socialize walmart i mean it would be as easy as is just buying out the shares you know and using taxes on the rich to uh, finance that kind of thing and now you've got that and that's really not a that's an easy easy lift like uh, no one's going to be really all that I say perturbed if you uh, knock off the Waltons and now you have a publicly owned Walmart that otherwise, you know, is operating s- somewhat similarly. Um, and you could go down the line and you find your your 50, 60 percent of the way there with stuff that's really not all that controversial before you start getting into some genuinely thorny issues around, um, you know, podcasts. You are focused on the fact that, well, they're, they're, it's not an employee kind of relationship, mm-hmm. but an even bigger issue there is a, is a personal expression, right? Um, we don't want purely state-owned media, I wouldn't imagine. Um, so we want to allow some in the creative arts. We want people to be able to probably do some things privately you know um Mm -hmm. so yeah no for sure i mean that that makes a lot of sense i mean you you could have um i mean you could of course have like media you know co-ops and it's it's, it's not like those don't already exist you know that 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 sort of that takes away maybe some of the uh the the freedom of expression uh worry but uh but even with you know even with co-ops like uh i don't know i remember seeing a uh i think um, you know, like there is like a little bit of a, uh, I mean, maybe it's not worth dwelling too much on these sort of line drawing questions, but I mean, like there are, but, you know, but there is, um, I think like any sort of, um, realistic co-op, certainly actually existing co-ops, uh, don't like, um, you know, like don't offer like membership to like everybody who like, you know, I mean, if they if they like advertise, they need somebody to help come in and help out for two weeks, right? You know, they they don't sure. they a voted member of the co-op because they did that. Well, and 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 you know, if you wanted to start your own media thing, I mean, I guess you could 
by law require that as you're getting bigger, it needs to be a co-op. Right. But if I can't get into one of the existing media co-ops, but I have something that I would like to publish, you know, I should probably be able to publish that on my own to the extent that that's possible, right? Um, so what would that be, you know? a post i guess but yeah right <laughs> yeah i mean you could also uh i think you could also maybe have um you know i i think i mean this is something i was thinking about a little a little bit last year when the uh the um the current affairs uh blow up happened and the sort of initial way that was represented was that it was about you know turn it into worker co-op or not I think the more I saw of the, you know, he said, she said of that, the more it seemed like, okay, there are like six people who have, you know, full-time jobs here and like five of them have board seats anyway. So it's like the actual gap between what existed and that was like a little bit unclear to me, but like stepping back a little bit from the specifics of that case and just thinking about the more general um, issue in the abstract, I mean, I, I can see maybe in some cases like that, uh, or like, you know, it doesn't even have to like, that's a political example, but I mean, it could even like be like, uh, we could think about like artistic ones with, uh, it's like, I don't know, like a movie, right. You know, do you, uh, yeah, do you yeah. it, it, it might be, there might be some advantage to, to give him certain kinds of dictatorial power to, uh, to, uh, to, to like one person, uh, in, um, uh, in a movie production scenario, but even there, maybe there are ways to sort of separate out this like kind of uh, creative control from like, you know, general business decisions. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, yeah. And I, and these uh, pieces of the firm, they, mm -hmm. they can be split into different sections and that, that goes into another um, part of this debate, I guess, um, and where people divide on different things. Right. So, uh, for example, you know, in my preferred system, you know, some people are real into worker co-ops. You know, they're real. That that's like the be-all, end-all. I'm I'm mm -hmm. more lukewarm on them, and instead, I will say, well, I'm I'm actually more interested in state-owned enterprises and social wealth mm -hmm. funds, and I guess general government services. But those are very similar to state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. And you know, the way they'll come back is they'll be like, well you know, that'll just be the state kind of dictating what happens to the workers in the firm. And now it's that sort of like a state capitalist almost, you know, it's like you're just recreating the problem. And then you can come back and you can say, well, look, actually, right, we can kind of hybridize all of this, right? So mm -hmm. the state could be the owner. And then the state could control a certain amount of the board seats, meaning that they get to appoint people um, to be on those seats two-thirds, half, whatever. And then the workers in each firm could control some of the board seats. So maybe they get to appoint a third of the, of, of the board. Um, and then separately, so separate from just like top executive control, you also have the question of workers' wages and conditions. That doesn't necessarily need to be something that goes through the board. That can be mm -hmm. something that's negotiated through a union, even in a, in a state-owned situation. So you would have, you know, state ownership, you'd have a mixed board appointed by both the state and other entities, especially workers in the firm, then the working conditions would be hived off into a, a union contract negotiated by a sector union. Um, and then in each like establishment little workshop, you would have like your union steward, and they would do certain kinds of things. And so, you know, you can kind of disperse it out into different entities and chop it up and, and you know, get what you want out of it. Um, of course, what I'm describing basically describes, you know, the, the Nordic, the Nordic model, you know, in, in those countries, the workers are entitled to appoint up to a third of the board. The wages and conditions are set with sector agreements. And there's a lot of state ownership. Um, that seems to work well. And you can see it's not like an all or nothing. It's kind of a, a mixture of uh, state ownership and kind of co-op style power, you know. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>